Of course, we've seen the amount of emissions coming from the aviation sector more than half during the course of the pandemic, but that's because so many planes have been grounded. Is it possible to, possible to hang on to some of that progress once international travel is resumed fully? Well, Heidi, yes, uh, I think uh, this is the uh, uh, real uh, issue uh, for the airline industry. It has been an issue uh, even uh, before COVID. Uh, so um, I think uh, we need to redouble our efforts uh, to uh, ensure that we meet our decarbonization goals. Uh, thus far, the industry's uh, uh, long-term goal has been to uh, halve 2005 emissions uh, by uh, 2050. Uh, this was uh, uh, constructed uh, when the uh, Paris Agreement uh, uh, assumption uh, was that uh, you know we should limit the uh, increase in the temperature uh, to not more than uh, two degrees uh, centigrade uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels. Uh, but the uh, uh, the popular wisdom now uh, is that this will not be uh, enough. Uh, we will need to um, you know make sure that the temperature increase uh, remains below. Uh, 1.5 degrees C, and uh, and uh, we think that uh, the best way to 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 achieve that uh, is to go towards uh, net zero uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions reductions by 2050. So the problem is aviation is long considered one of the hardest sectors to decarbonize, right? And a lot of the climate planning and ambitions have been based around carbon offsetting. Is there progress being made in terms of developing and, and commercializing the sort of technology and energy sources that would enable these jets to fly without emitting as much greenhouse gases? Yes, the, the industry's uh, decarbonization agenda is built upon uh, uh, four uh, pillars. Uh, one is uh, the innovation and uh, technology enhancement. Two, um, operations uh, improvements. Uh, three, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, and of course, market-based measures uh, like offsets that you mentioned. Um, for long-haul operations, and 80% of uh, Asia-Pacific airline uh, operations are, are long-haul. That means above uh, 1,500 kilometers. Um, the main uh, uh, main pillar uh, is going to be uh, sustainable aviation fuels. So uh, efforts are underway uh, to make sure that you know we have the uh, uh, necessary uh, support uh, uh, as well as uh, incentives you know, uh, for for the uh, industry to be able to acquire enough uh, sustainable mm. uh, aviation to but make sure that there is cost effective supply. But not just about the industry, right? When it comes to sustainable aviation fuels, how much coordination do you also need and cooperation and support from the government as well as oil companies? Well, I think the uh, this is going to be an all-industry uh, effort. Uh, it cannot be achieved by just the, the uh, airlines. Uh, we need the uh, uh, stakeholders uh, within the aviation ecosystems to all... Uh, uh, put in uh, the uh, efforts. We have the governments, we have the fuel suppliers, uh, we have the airports and navigation service providers, the finance sector there, and of course the uh, manufacturers of aircraft and engines. They've all got to play their part. Governments will have to, uh, you know, uh, consider subsidies and incentives as well as invest in R&D and development of the production and distribution and supply chains in order to make sure that there are sufficient uh, uh, supplies of uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Also, you know, we need a lot of uh, facilities you know, to, to produce these uh, sustainable aviation fuels and distribution and supply chains, which at the moment, uh, these facilities are lacking in the Asia-Pacific region. How much leeway do airlines have to put sustainability as a priority when they are just trying to stay afloat during this coronavirus pandemic? Yes, well, first and foremost, it is not only the airlines, I think the whole industry, including the uh, governments and fuel suppliers, uh, will have to uh, also uh, front up uh, in order for the uh, the supply of uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuels to be cost effective. Uh, but I think uh, this is uh, uh, an endemic issue uh, for the airlines, uh, apart from, of course, uh, COVID-19. And uh, both these uh, issues will have to be uh, uh, tackled uh, with a progressive agenda, and that is what the Asia-Pacific Airlines uh, are working on uh, in order to be able to ensure uh, 
uh, that we meet our decarbonization goal. So it is a commitment. A commitment is not just a, a, a pledge, uh, but also uh, requires a pathway to be established. And this pathway, as I mentioned with the four pillars, uh, is called Waypoints 2050. Waypoints is a navigation system used by pilots you know, to uh, get to a destination with markers and milestones. You know? And so uh, we have that in place. Uh, offsets uh, are already uh, being uh, uh, applied uh, with the Corsia Carbon uh, Offsets and Reduction Scheme in Aviation uh, to uh, ensure that the growth that is uh, happening in the industry uh, is uh, on a carbon neutral basis. You know? And then with the rest of the pillars kicking in, uh, we should be able to uh, achieve uh, uh, the um, uh, milestone uh, uh, commitment of net zero carbon emissions uh, reductions by 2050. Uh, and Subhas, we're just getting the latest virus numbers out of China. They've reported 92 new coronavirus cases uh, and 59 of those local COVID cases coming from Fujian province, which of course is where we see the latest, most serious breakout of Delta and those lockdown measures taking place. It's uh, a little bit depressing, I think, when you take a look around the Asia-Pacific and, and look at the slow pace of recovery when it comes to opening up uh, and international travel. When do you see the catch-up kind of and, and the pent-up demand being able to be released in this part of the world? Well, as you know, I think everything depends on the uh, vaccination rates. You know, uh, the world is, in, is divided into two halves. You know, there's one half uh, uh, which is uh, able to open up... Uh, uh, travel and the other half uh, who are hoping that they can, uh, but it depends on whether they can up their vaccination uh, levels. The Asia-Pacific uh, uh, region, uh, with the exception of a few places, uh, most of them are lagging behind the world average in terms of vaccination rates. Uh, most governments are redoubling efforts to increase their vaccination levels. And uh, once that is, uh, that is a pace, I think uh, what is possible uh, is that, you know, we can uh, look forward to a vaccination-based threshold framework for reopening travel, uh, starting with the vaccinated uh, residents you know, uh, and uh, between places uh, where the vaccination uh, uh, rates have, uh, have uh, propped up. Um, I would think that uh, for the region, uh, it is likely that inter-region uh, travel will open up first before intra-region travel, you know, because right. many places... Uh, uh, opening up uh, to the Asia-Pacific region. And if you look at the progression of vaccination levels, uh, you're looking at probably uh, 2023 or 2024, you know, mm. before uh, you can see the uh, recovery uh, to 2019 levels uh, coming around. So, but just quickly, what do you say to government still pursuing elimination strategies and the need for vaccine passports at some point? Well, I think uh, that's that's going to be very difficult uh, to to carry out uh, because COVID-19. I think everyone is saying is uh, is going to be endemic. Uh, so um, you know, as I said, both these endemic issues uh, uh, restart as well as uh, uh, um, um, sustainability will uh, have to be tackled with a progressive agenda, progressive strategies. You know. Uh, so risk uh, aversion is not uh, is going, not going to help uh, in this uh, progress.